Uh, welcome to this session of the Permit COE webinar series. Today, uh, Miguel Ponce de Leon is going to talk about biomedicine, supercomputers, and simulations in silico experiments and its applications in cancer research. Uh, my name is Daniel Tomás López. I am involved in Permit COE on behalf of Embel EBI, and I am going to host this webinar. Before starting, I would like to make you aware that the, the webinar is being recorded, including the uh, questions and answers section, and that the recording will be disseminated afterwards. After the presentation, we will have uh, time for questions, so please use the Q&A function in your Zoom panel for asking questions during the webinar. Permit COE is the HPC, HPC Exascale Center of Excellence for Personalized Medicine in Europe. Permit COE focuses on simulation of cellular mechanistic models, which are essential to translate omics data into medical actions. The performance of uh, cell simulation software is still not enough to address um, problems such as tumor evolution or finding personalized treatment for patients. Permit COE will scale up uh, the software for cell simulation to the present HPC exasic scale systems in order to enable the creation of models of cellular function for medical relevance. Permit COE will achieve this through a series of objectives. First, it will optimize selected cell level simulation software uh, to run in pre exascale platforms. Second, a Permit COE is uh, developing a series of use cases uh, to showcase the applications of Permit COE products in different fields such as uh, drug synergies for cancer treatments or performing multi-scale modeling of uh, COVID-19 patients, uh, uh, virus and patients tissue. Uh, additionally, Permit COE also has as objectives uh, training the biomedical uh, professionals in the use of HPC exascale permit tools, uh, integrating the permit communities into the European HPC exascale ecosystem, and building the basis for the sustainability of the Permit COE. Today's webinar is part of a first group of webinars presenting the tools used in Permit COE. And let me now introduce uh, our speaker, our speaker Miguel Ponce de Leon. Uh, Miguel is a postdoctoral researcher at the Computational Biology Group of BSC. His area of expertise is in the field of systems biology and scientific computation where most of his research has been on reconstruction and simulation of biological networks. His line of research is the development of systems biology and modeling approaches to integrate heterogeneous sources of information with a particular focus on cancer. His work has two main objectives. First, developing tools to assist in the decision-making process, uh, personalized medicine. And second, improving the knowledge of basic cancer biology. So, uh, Miguel, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Daniel. I will start by sharing the screen. Uh, this should be the one. Is it correct? Uh, yes. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for the kind introduction. My name is Miguel, and now I will jump directly into the presentation, which is entitled Biomedicine Supercomputer and Simulation, a Silicon Experiment and its application in cancer research. So this is a, a little bit fancy title, but it tried to capture most of the topic that we will introduce in this presentation. And uh, we have developed the presentation to a broad audience uh, with the idea of engaging people, not in the computational biology community, but in our communities, uh, in order to get in contact with these kind of simulations and how they can be applied in, in our research fields. So this is just an, an overview on the presentation. We will start with uh, a brief introduction and motivation and computational uh, why complexity in biological systems and why modeling. Then we will go into computational biology of cancer and how it goes multicellular. Uh, a roadmap to precision medicine. Uh, we'll have some multi-scale modeling for virtual screening. And then on the roadmap to more realistic simulation, scaling in size and, and complexity. And, and we will close up with some perspective and and seeing how, how this field is, is moving on to the future. So as most of the people in the audience will know, molecular biology has become big data uh, since 20 or 30 years ago with the development of uh, sequencing technologies. 
So in the presgenomic era, biological knowledge was evident. So we had a single gene sequence. You can see it in the hell. You could see if the gene was expressed or not. But uh, with the development of high throughput technologies, uh, we become in an era of massive generation of biological data. And when we combine high throughput technologies by informatics, uh, it gets rises what is called the omic revolution. Uh, so uh, in the last 30 years, we have developed huge catalog of the component of the cellular systems and, and the interaction between these components uh, and map of interactions. Uh, but we still have the question, uh, do we have the genome? Can we predict the phenotype? So we can here see the virtual human metabolism uh, from our colleague Unilu in Minerva. This is uh, just a, a zoom from from the human metabolism, we are starting to zoom out. And this is a simplified chart of human metabolism. And now come the questions. What happened if we knock down this gene? So this is a very complicated and complex question. And we can set the question in another domain. Can I evaluate fix a radio? This is a, a really interesting paper. It's more philosophical than scientific, but I think it's, it's very critical in this era of uh, big data so the question they said in the paper if i is open a radio and see all this or help me in complexity how we can try to fix the radio by checking and naming and grouping the different components of the radio and and the answer is uh, it's more or less trivial at least in the radio we need this kind of, of models we in engineer they have developed for for several years maybe 100 years this kind of diagrams that abstract the different functions of the component in terms of resistors or capacitors or antennas. And then with these abstract maps, you can create a model that allows you to uh, perform simulations and assess the effect of touching here and there. So that's why we need models. And in, in the field of, uh, okay, this is just uh, for wrapping up, this is a paper from Hardwell from the 1999. And at that time, it was almost 25 years ago. Uh, it was clear that uh, to test our understanding of cells, uh, we need to make quantitative predictions in the same way physics and engineers do with all kinds of systems. And in order to do that, we will require detailed simulations of biological, biochemical processes taking place within the cells. So uh, modeling system biology is uh, an iterative process, as uh, most of the present here, people here know, uh, biological systems are very complex systems, are probably the most complex systems we know, and we don't have specific laws that, like, like we had in physics. So the, the, the process of generating a model, it's more iterative than developing laws <laughs> of physics. So we got models that can use different mathematical or computational tools to represent a particular biological system and to simulate different processes we need. We run simulations and we translate these simulations into hypotheses that can be tested in experiments and then we can conduct experiments and we can use this experiment to validate the predictions of our models and then we can go back into the model and see okay this is working this is not working there is a gap in the knowledge of our model we didn't know this metabolic pathway or we didn't know this interaction between this protein and this bones and we can refine the model and make it more predictable so computational biology has several challenges and we can group the challenges in, in these different groups. Uh, data is heterogeneous. We have different type of data that needs to be processed in different way. We got transcriptomic, which is produced with a technology and has different biases and different approaches to be processed. Uh, we got a protein expression or single cell variation. Now we are coming with a single cell or special transcriptomics. Data is always sparse and incomplete. We don't have all the parameters or all the variables for, for our system, we have part of it. Then we have the problem of uh, network heterogeneity. It's not the same to have a signal in network at transcription regulation or metabolic. So we need different mathematical approaches for simulate different biological networks. And then we have the problem of have multiple time and length scales. Uh, metabolism go faster. Uh, transcription is a little bit slower, replication is even lower, and growth can take days. So this is more or less uh, where we are standing as modelers. So, so far we have uh, seen two previous webinars, one on metabolic modeling that uh, 
been uh, from people of UNILU, they, they present COBREXA, which is a tool for simulating metabolic models. And we also have seen uh, the webinar on, on MAVOS and, and future will come to the NOP, that are tool for, for simulating signaling and, and regulatory networks. And this is uh, what most people have been doing in system biology in, in, in the last uh, maybe 20, 30 years, maybe some more years. But we have this model to, to understand a particular biological network and to predict what happened if we perturb the system. But in cancer, we know that uh, we only, we, besides coping with uh, cell complexity, we, we got other kind of complexity. We have microenvironment complexity. We know that tumor interact with other cells. Uh, and we know that tumors have this time complexity, that evolution, that tumors evolve in time and they respond to drugs and new clones appear and, and they spread over. And so in order to, to formulate a more realistic model that can give us mechanistic explanation, we, only, we, we, we also need to take into account the, the, the population level, not only the intracellular one, but what also what happened at, at the level of cell-cell uh, -cell interactions and interaction with cells and, and the environment. And that has rise to several tools, in particular, we're interested in PC cell, which is one of the core tools of the permed coil. This is the title is computational cancer biology of multicellular, because PC cell is an, an open source physical, physi physics based cell simulator for 3D multicellular system. And it was developed in, in Indiana University in Bloomington by uh, the lead of, of Paul Macklin. So what are multiscale models? Uh, well, multiscale models are a kind of hybrid approach that combine different modeling approaches. Uh, they have at the bottom, or in particular, physicel, an, an agent-based model uh, to simulate individual cells. And then inside individual cells, we can uh, add different kind of modeling approaches for simulating cell signaling or metabolic or cell cycle. And the multiscale uh, nature comes because different processes take place at different time scales. For instance, diffusion or metabolism take place at uh, one time scale much faster than the mechanics or the mechanical interaction between cells or the movements of the cells. And then we have other cell processes, as I explained earlier, take longer processes. So we have to couple uh, these different processes taking place in different time scales. And that's why we, we call this kind of model multiscale models. So in PCCell, uh, we got different components. Uh, one of the components is the, the microenvironment, which is described as a discrete domain. So we, we have this uh, huge grid of voxels, and each voxel is the, 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 the unit of, of the microenvironment. And basically what PCCell allows is to simulate uh, how molecules diffuse, how they can decay, uh, because chemical or thermal motion or thermal interaction, and, how they can be uh, consumed or produced by cells. And it's also allowed to, to simulate the, the boundary condition. That is, uh, if the substrate is giving uh, supply to the system or it's go out of the system, that, that's what's called it. And here we have some examples of possible densities or molecules like oxygen or drugs or substrate. And this is how it looks under a hood. So all these things, uh, when we are going to run simulations, we can go into a setting file and define the size of our environment, the resolution of the voxels, uh, how long the simulation will take, the, 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 the time scale for the different processes, uh, the units, and, uh, and also the different uh, substrate or densities we want to have. Here we have oxygen and you have the diffusion coefficient, the carry rate and, and the boundary condition and so on. The next component are, are the cells. Cells are modeled as individual agents, and in the definition, they got a, a size or a volume, they got a position in the grid, uh, they got a particular phenotype, which is composed for several models, with several models, like cell cycle, death models, uh, Houston rules are given by the modeler, and you also have intracellular models. And intracellular models is something that I'm going to play later. So here we have some examples, metabolic signaling, receptors, and then we have cell behaviors like growth, migration or movement, cell cell interaction, chemical interaction with the environment. And we can, of course, uh, model different cell types by, by, by configuring or, or setting different settings of all these properties. And this is how it looks under a hood. We have in the configuration file a list of cell definition. Here we can define a cell, a cancer cell, which will have a particular cell cycle model with even rate or 
particular uh, phenotype. Uh, this is duplicated, sorry, it should be showing uh, the death model. It doesn't matter, it looks the same, but instead of saying cell cycle, say apoptosis, a different rate, then we have volume, motility, and so on and so forth. So here it's a, a very, very, very short, it's not short, but I, I just put it. This is a, a, an example uh, from, from this cell developed by Paul Macklin, and this is just uh, cancer cells growing. Uh, they grow in proportion to a non-coprotein they express stochastically, and the red cells are the new system, and they have a rule, and they follow. Uh, so cells grow according to the level of oncoprotein, and, and, and the immune system can detect them. So I just wanted uh, to show how assimilation looks like, but I, I will go because I don't want to spend too much time. You, you, you can find it later in, in the online page, the link, and, and so on. To, to the video. So uh, after physical was developed, or, or at the same time, uh, people at the Institute Curie, uh, guided by, by Laurence Calzon, and main developer was Gael Letor, they start to, to integrate in, in Curie. They, are, they have been working for, for many, many years, have a lot of experience in, in modeling signaling networks. They have uh, MAVOS, that Vincent present uh, in the previous seminar, which is a tool for simulating signaling and regulatory. Uh, networks, and uh, they, they, they wanted to, to integrate this, uh, this signaling modeling approach into this uh, multi-scale agent-based model, and that gave rise to, to FISIVOS, was the, the, the first combination of, of this hybrid approach that allowed to, to push this uh, signaling network into, into multicellular simulations. This is just a, a joke, but it's a, a good lesson we, we learned during the, the development of the second version of, of FISIVOS. Uh, FISI cell wasn't uh, mature when when FISI was was uh, it began the development and uh, FISI cell keep uh, changing and evolving and FISI was start diverging from the original FISI cell and that become a problem at certain point because the, the merging was not easy and basically it was not possible anymore so instead of having a, a single tool with component we had two different tools so the maintenance become very, very complicated. So this is just a, a software get complex. It's also does it maintenance. This is just a show from XKCD. Uh, but uh, in collaboration with Curie from BSC, we, we guide a little bit the, the development or re-implementation or refactoring of, of FISIVOS. So it makes it more, 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 more evolvable, more sustainable in the long term. And that gives rise to FISIVOS.0, which is a sustainable integration of stochastic Boolean and agent based modeling framework. So basically, we decouple uh, the part which is related to MAVOS and the part that are related to FISIZ and create this add on interface, which makes the two software uh, uh, independent and they can evolve. And we only need to take care of uh, updating the interface whenever something very important changes in FISIZ. And this gives rise to a model of uh, developing add-ons, not only for, for simulating signaling, but as you will see, for simulating metabolism and other intracellular models. Uh, so this is under the hood again. Now you can, uh, thanks to Vincent, we, we can set in, in the definition of the cell what kind of uh, MAVOS model we want to have, and we can set the initial state. And in the near future, we will also standardize the connection between the microenvironment and, and the Boolean nodes of the model, and uh, how uh, different state of the of the Boolean network can trigger different uh, standard agent behavior, and, and and that would be the idea. And also to extend the framework to enable mutations, and we have a, a to-do list and a wish list. We we want to to add uh, new functionalities in EPCBOS. So in the road to precision medicine, I will uh, briefly present an example to uh, ground back this, uh, these ideas into a model and a particular question. So this is from the original uh, FISIVOS paper. Uh, they, as a proof of concept, they, they integrate this uh, cell fate model. It's a, a signaling or a regulatory network uh, tailored to cancer cells developed by Laurence many years ago. And they integrated into an agent based model of a, of a tumor spheroid. And, and they were interested in, in, in seeing what happens if you provide different uh, TNF or tumor necrosis factor pulses uh, with different regimes and how this affects the growth, which is the, the, the green curve, the number of cells. So, red are apoptotic cells, uh, black curve, it's uh, necrotic cells, and, and the green are alive. 
So they developed this pulse experiment and, and they found out this uh, complex dynamics. So cells become resistant, they are exposed for longer periods, but if you provide short pulses, they show this emergent property that cells start dying and do not develop resistance. So uh, even this is not a validated result, uh, it's an interesting proof of concept to extend the model and, and, and to test tools. And of course, in, in a nearby future, we would like to, to apply this to, uh, to validate the data or, or data that can be experimentally validated. So in BSC, in collaboration with Arnau and, and collaborators from other projects, we, we develop uh, or extend a, a workflow uh, for running uh, in silico experiment or multiscale in silico simulations. And we, we split the process in, in these uh, four different parts. First, we got the, the model definition, where we define what is our biological uh, system, what are the critical parameters, uh, and how the model is formulated in terms of equation networks. Then we got a step of model calibration, where we ideally have experimental data to uh, run simulations and feed this experimental data to find out the value of those unknown parameters that in these cases are a large number of parameters. And finally, we got into, into the fun part or the interesting part, which is the, the model exploration. It's when we can use this uh, in silico simulator to, to perform experiment and for instance, optimize user goals, like reduce uh, tumor size with minimal dosage. So following the, the, the example of the TNF, we basically in our re-implemented version of PCCL, extend the model one of the extension was add an explicit transport mechanism or not transport, but receptor uh, process or mechanism for the TNF. So this is more or less based on, on the biology of how TNF act. It binds to a receptor and based on the level of a TNF receptor, it, it, it turns on one of the nodes on, on the Willian model which uh, reflect that TNF is present and it propagates the signal downstream. And, and this uh, receptor can be recycled with a given rate. So the TNF bind with a given rate, and then the TNF gets degraded inside the cell and it gets uh, free again. So this is more or less based on biology and, and the connection, it, it, it's also follow the, the bibliographic. And that's more or less the model, that this, this component. So each individual cell agent has uh, this, this integration of hybrid model. Uh, so, I don't want to redundate, but those are the model components. So this is uh, simulated using a uh, ordinary differential equation. It's a traditional kinetic model. Then we have this transfer function to connect this continuous variable into Boolean one. Here we're just using a step function. Then we got the signal in Boolean model in which we got Boolean nodes that can uh, represent proteins that are active or inactive based they are phosphorylated or phosphorylated and have different interactions, activation or signaling and act as a uh, logic gate, but this has been already discussed by this in, 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 in the previous seminar. But one of the nice things of this model, it has uh, three readouts or cell fate. It can be proliferate, non-apoptotic dead or, or necrosis or apoptosis. And those are exclusive, uh, exclusive uh, states. So even a cell can be in proliferation or in apoptosis or so in the Boolean state, we tell you what the cell is going to, to do. So uh, we get uh, in the idea of uh, finding optimal, so extend the, the, the results from, from the previous paper of the people of QD, and we wanted to further explore this uh, treatment space or parameter space associated to the treatment. So we set up a, a workflow for, for performing this in silico experiment, model exploration. So these are the parameters we are interested, the concentration, the pulse period, and the duration of the injection. And uh, we are going to run several simulations, as we'll see, and we'll try to find values for these three parameters that minimize the number of cells or number of alive cells or, or the tumor. So in order to do that, because simulations are computationally expensive and we need to run them in the cluster and we need to run several of them in order to, to get uh, an idea of what are the, the proper value for the parameter, we use, uh, or we develop a, a framework or a workflow based on, on EMUSE, which is, this extreme scale model exploration with Swift. It's a, a template for doing model exploration based on a computing language for cluster called Swift. And the idea here is we got our model exploration, which can be anything like a genetic algorithm. It's something that learned from the parameter. One critical point from the simulations, they are black box simulations. 
basically we cannot calculate derivates and, and, and calculate gradients to move into the space, say, okay, if we tweak the parameter, the cost function, that is the number of cells will decrease. We cannot do that. The model is very complex and we can only assess the effect of a parameter by running a simulation. So we really need to run uh, thousands of simulations. So this workflow basically generate parameters, uh, they communicate to a workflow, the workflow, uh, the workflow distribute the evaluation of the model. So we run several simulations in parallel after the simulation finish, they give back the result into a workflow. The workflow assess uh, if the simulation or the parameters were good or not, and it informs the model exploration that will learn from these already evaluated parameters. It will update its internal state, it could be a statistical distribution, it could be something else like a genetic algorithm that will generate new parameters that we will evaluate and we will iterate over and over until a uh, stop condition it can be a number of iteration or it can be which uh, achieved uh, desired goal. Uh, this is just a uh, preliminary results and a paper we, we submit today. Uh, we explore this parameter in, in, in two different uh, tissue geometries in a 2D disk of cells, like uh, an epithelia and a, and a, sorry, this should be a 3D asteroid. And just a brief summary, this uh, have the different parameter. We find out that uh, depending on the shape, uh, parameters may differ or the optimal set of parameter. Here we, we just pick those parameters that can reduce uh, the original size of the tumor to below 1% of its initial size. And you can see uh, the 3D asteroid, which is the red pulse. It's a little more picky. So uh, it's more sensitive to the TNF concentration. The values are more narrow and also to the pulse duration, where in the 2D case, uh, the values are more uh, relaxed, at least with respect to the 3D. And here it's uh, some examples of the simulation. Uh, you can see an optimal treatment. Uh, so this is not, this is a non-optimal non treatment. Of course, here the, the concentration is very low. Uh, so in, in the panel A, you can see that cells grow exponentially. These peaks here are the pulses. And in the B panel, you can see an average of the internal uh, TNF model I show. So how TNF uh, binds to the receptor and trigger signals. And as you can see here, the, the blue curve didn't reach the threshold for triggering and so cells to not commit apoptosis or necrosis. Uh, this is a case where the TNF concentration is very high. So because cells become exposed for longer period of time, uh, they stop committing apoptosis. So we got a, a first peak of cells dying, but they, they recover because there is a feedback loop in the, in the signaling model that uh, all those cells enable cells to, to avoid uh, committing apoptosis or necrosis after they are exposed for, for longer period of time to the TNF. And this is an optimal treatment. This is a proper balance between activating cells while avoiding resistance. And as you can see, uh, the, the blue pool reaches for shortest peaks, uh, the threshold, and you can see plop, plop, periodic drop of cells until it reaches there. So this is a, a, a wrap up from all this part. So a complex dynamical, dynamic multiscale models are highly complex objects that are not reducible to formal analytical form. So we, we cannot have equations in the same physics uh, has and uh, calculate the steady state and the stability. We need to run simulation. So we need to, to, to treat these multiscale models as experimental objects themselves and use them uh, to do this simulation experiment in the similar way we do with the, their biological counterparts. And the behavior of this model can only be evaluated by running very large number of simulations. And this uh, is a multifaceted process referred to model exploration. And this is something that has be, that needs to be developed in in parallel with the development of the model. So to, to explore the model are also so needed as, as, as we need models. So now on the roadmap to more realistic simulation, scaling in size and, and in complexity. So uh, as Daniel explained, one of the aim of the permed code is to scale up uh, complex uh, computational biology tools to leverage the next generation of HPC exascale platforms. So one of the limitations of physics cell uh, uh, it was uh, it's a, a tool developed in C++ and it used OpenMP, which is a library for parallel, but it only allowed to parallel simulation in a single computer, in a single computing node. Uh, so that's the, oops, it does, it's not 105, it's uh, 10 to the, to the fifth or 10 to the sixth. 
that's the number of, of cells that can be simulated in, in a desktop computer using four to six CPUs. Uh, but as you will see, simulation, it's not only that it will grow in size to become realistic, but it will also will, will, will increase the complexity and then uh, the computing time that it will require to update each agent will be uh, higher and higher as we add more intracellular models to the agent. So having the, the software to run in a single uh, computing node is a big limitation. Uh, so that's uh, motivated the, the, the develop of what is called PCCLX. So this was uh, the first step. Uh, one of uh, the millstone or, or not the, 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 the cornerstone of, of PCCL, it's called BioFBM, which is a solver for simulating the environment. So with the amazing work of Golob Saxena in collaboration with Anao, and me and, and David and Alfonso, Golob uh, implemented the, the first MPI version of, of this uh, um, simulator. So that was the, the first step for pushing PCCL into a distributed parallel simulator. Uh, so now Golob has already finished the parallelization of, of PCCL, not only by FPM, but the whole framework. Uh, and basically, it allows for scaling the simulation in size. Uh, now we can run bigger domains and large number of cells. Uh, but it's also allowed to scale in model complexity. So imagine that uh, in addition to MAVOS, we have like uh, metabolic models and other models of other uh, molecular networks of the cell running in each agent. If we have one million agents, we will need to update one million uh, Mavoses, one million track balance analysis or whatever uh, approach we use for, for simulating uh, the metabolism. And we will need to run all these models in the million of cells each time step. So having this parallel version of, uh, uh, sorry, I need to mute this. Uh, having this distributed parallel version of PCCL will, will allow to, to make this uh, realistic simulation run in unrealistic time. And I mean, in, in, in time that is useful for, for the modeler and, and the researcher. Uh, this is just a, an example uh, that uh, this is a, a, a milestone that got a child. It was able to, to run almost uh, 10 million Asian. This is an, a, a simple example that uh, model, uh, the, a predator prey example is, is, is just an example for testing that the functionality of the, the, the parallel implementation is working properly. But you can see here the million of patients moving smoothly in the domain. So that was a great, great achievement. Uh, something else we are doing is uh, adding metabolism to the PC cells. So this is, we, we started this uh, a couple of years ago in collaboration with, with Paul Mackey in Indiana. And, and, and the idea is in, in the same way that uh, PC was provide the capability of, uh, or the functionality to all of patients to have internal signaling that can respond to the environment and, and trigger different events. We also want to, to have the individual cells to have metabolic models that can predict the growth rate or the import of the fluxes, the excretion, and so on, and make the simulation more realistic. Uh, so we have uh, this in progress, which is uh, something similar to CIGOS. It's a, a pluggable uh, add-on that will enable physical cell to, to run metabolic models inside the agent. This is work in progress, but it's a combination of a system validation markup language, uh, an optimization library, and we have developed this in uh, in the same way. Uh, the lesson we we, we have we learned from from Physiwall, so very decoupled from Physiwall itself. Uh, so this is the wrap up or the uh, take home message from this part: that complex simulations or complex mechanical models are powerful tools to conduct complex in silico experiment, but to bring this model closer to clinical scenarios, such as simulating the evolutionary evolution of tumors, we still need more powerful modeling tools able to, to produce more realistic simulations. Uh, so with the current state art of the method, we are still unable to simulate a complex scenario, such as a real size invasive tumor uh, of a regular shape and its relation to the rest of the body, the physiology, uh, the immune system, and so on. So the, the, as, as we commented previously, Permacore aims to scale up computational biology tools to, to leverage next generation HPC exascale platform so we, we can uh, reach more realistic simulations. So now we, we go into, into perspectives. Uh, 
So this is a, a, a probably upcoming paper. It's still in, in the bioarchive, uh, but the, it's, it's a paper where they, they develop a, a technology based on interpretation in artificial intelligence, sorry, uh, to basically reconstruct in silico uh, a tissue or an organ based on, on different sources of information. So uh, my point here is to show that experimental data is becoming more and more complex. It's not only about sequencing, not only about single sequence, single cell sequencing or, or epigenomics or metabolomics. Now we, we are starting to reconstruct in silico pieces of tissue or organs, and we have omic data and the spatial distribution of this omic data and the marker. And the question is how we can use this data to calibrate models. Uh, so this is an, another show from XKCD. I'm very fun, but we have a lot of data and uh, finding out a proper model and what we should fit. It's a, it's a very, very hard or complicated question. Uh, and I've been, and we've been discussing uh, this question uh, very deeply, uh, what we should do, what data we should uh, use to fit parameters in the model. And, and I think uh, time to time we should check other, other fields and, and see what they are doing. And for instance, in, in ecology, they, they have been working uh, with Asian based or individual based model for, for several years, many years, uh, maybe more than than in cancer biology or in molecular biology. And they have learned a lot of things. And something they come out, uh, it's this idea of the uh, pattern-oriented modeling. And, and the idea is, is not to have a single curve to fit, but to identify complex pattern, different set of, of complex pattern from, from our system. Here, I, I want to, to do an analogy between the complex system that can be a tissue or an organ and the complex system that can be a, a forest. And basically what they, they learn from working in with complex uh, Asian-based models to try to model complex ecosystem is that we need to define multiple patterns observed in the real system in different hierarchy level, hierarchical levels and scales and use them systematically to optimize uh, model complexity and, and to reduce uncertainty. Uh, so we have the real system, we have observed patterns and then Using this pattern, we define the structure of our models. And then it's also the, 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 the payoff of, of model complexity, right? And this, this metaware zone where the model shouldn't be very simple and shouldn't be very complex. It should be in the trade-off where we can uh, reproduce this complex pattern, but the model is not too complicated. That cannot be calibrated or the degree of percentanity is very high. Uh, and this is just uh, another perspective. So this is also from, from ecology on, on, on the left side. You, you can see this protocol that, that was developed. Uh, it's called the overview design and detail design concept and, and detail protocol. And this should be uh, the guiding of the design of a model. A model should have a proposed. It should have clear defined the state variables and the scales. It should have a clear process overview and the scheduling, how this process are updated and the order, how they are coupled. Uh, what are the design concepts of the model? How the model is in, initialized? Uh, what are the input of the model and what are the, the sub models of this model? And this should be uh, done uh, very rigorously in order to make this multi simulation transparent and, and reproducible. So here we are focused on physicists, but there are other tools for running these kind of simulations. And when we, we propose a, a new model for something, I, I believe that the model should be tool agnostic and the model should be clear stated and it should, and it in theory or ideally could be implemented in a different tool using a different framework and the result should be the same. Otherwise uh, we are in a big problem. And on, on, the, on the left, uh, we got something similar, but more, uh, more tailored to, to the field of, of, of cancer biology or, or, or molecular biology. And like uh, there is a community that has developed this uh, multi-cell DS uh, standard, which is something equivalent like to the system biology markup language, but it's, uh, it's intent to 
defining a standard for sharing uh, multi-cell data sets and to defining like the cell types, uh, to defining different models, how the models are connected, what are the interface between the model. And I think these two things are, are very connected and, and are very important in, in, in the road of creating this uh, transparent and, and reproducible simulation, which I think is critical. And uh, it's one of, uh, of the main advantage of, of running uh, mechanistic model instead of using other approaches like machine learning or artificial base. Here we have the explicit interaction, the system, the component, and so on. And I think we should keep this transparent vision of the model as far as we can. And I think that it's most of it. This is just the wrapping up. So complex multi model are powerful tool to conduct complex in silico experiment and to take quantitative predictions, to make quantitative predictions. But to, to bring these models closer to clinical scenario, we require detailed simulations by a process, a physiological process taking place at different time space scales. And the primary aims to scale up computational biology tools, as we say, to leverage the next generation of HPC XML platform. Uh, in Permed, we will also develop a complex AI-based workflow for parameter calibration and also model exploration. And importantly, all, all this development will be guided by uh, different clinical use cases, including uh, cancer drug synergy. Uh, there is another use case on, 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 on COVID, but most of your cases will be come up in, in next webinar. So I, I, I don't want to, to spoil them. So I think that that's it. Uh, thank you for your time. And I think now it's, it's the time for, for, for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Miguel. Thank you very much for that uh, very nice uh, presentation. Uh, so just to remind everyone that you can use the Q&A button in your Zoom panel to ask questions. Uh, so we have a few already. So uh, the first one, Miguel, is, is it possible to simulate the effect of gold or other nanoparticles uh, on the cell with physicel? cell? Uh, yeah, in, in theory, yes. If you know what, what is the effect, so... In principle, you can simulate gold or any nanoparticle as a, any density of physicel, cell, like any molecule. Uh, what physicel cell is not going to answer to you is what the effect of gold. But if you know in, in, a, simple, in, a, in a simple case, what, what is the effect of a nanoparticle in a cell, and you can translate that into model, then you can simulate the effect and, and see if you can see emergent properties or, or explore how the diffusion of the nanoparticles will reach or not different part of the tissue. So the question is, yes, you, you can create a model that take into account nanoparticles, uh, but you need to know a little bit the details of how this uh, molecule or, or component interact with, with cells and, and the environment. Uh, you need uh, parameters for the diffusion and these kind of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question. Um, in the project with the TNF, the uh, tumor necrosis factor, uh, you are injecting a given concentration of TNF on the extremities of the spheroid. Do you have uh, any project where you perform injection to the center of the spheroid? And I didn't explain. Say, oh, sorry. sorry. Sorry, sorry. I didn't explain it, but uh, currently the way we are doing the injection is the same way they, they did it in, 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 the, in the first experiment. We, we create like a, an sphere of tenero, of TNF around the, the spheroid or, or, or the disc. It's not coming from, from the boundaries. Uh, we just uh, try to simulate like a microfluidic where the TNF suddenly appear all around the cells. Uh, but it can be easily changed. We just follow like the same uh, line of reasoning from the first paper, but changing the way the TNF or any other substance is supplied, it's more or less straightforward. Uh, it's something we, we, we are planning to do, so enable different treatment regimes, not only in the concentration, the duration, or the period, but only in the way the, 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 the molecule, the drug, or whatever it, it's supplied into the system. So the question is, yes, it can be done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, there, was a, there was a second part of the question saying if there was um, any, any link that uh, where you uh, talk about it, about that aspect, but I guess it's the... Um, the same paper, the same where you talk about physicists in general, right? So the, um, the question, yeah, specifically about this 
approach of injecting it to the to the center of the spheroid? Uh, well, we haven't tried into the center, but uh, we, but it can we, be done. We, we, yes, of course, of course. It's just setting up in the configuration file and instead of when, when you inject, so it's basically injection means uh, to go into the microenvironment, take a voxel and fix a quantity for a given duration of time. So it's, you can do, put TNF wherever you want in, mm -hmm. in the simulation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we have another question. Uh, to, which, to which extent the parallelization affect the attractor reachability in both synchronous and asynchronous updating schemes? Okay, so there are, uh, like the, the problem of the parallelization. So let's start. Uh, Mavos, it's, uh, it, I think it's kind of, I'm not an expert, but it's not exactly uh, a traditional Boolean modeling approach. So in the Boolean modeling, we, we got discrete time. And in, in Mavos, they, they got this uh, time continuous time, stochastic and use kind of a Gillespie algorithm. So the way parallelization within Mavos affect uh, the reachability or the probabilities of coming into one attractor or another, uh, I don't know, but I, I, I don't expect like parallelization has something to do with the probabilities. For, if the parallelization hasn't any bias, I don't expect any, any change in the probability of reaching one, one attractor or another attractor. Uh, in, in physical, the same, like, when you update the cells, uh, you run a MAVOS or a couple of steps in MAVOS for the different agents. And when you run it in parallel, basically you just have different computer running the different steps. So actually in, in, in FISIBOS, we, we don't run MAVOS in parallel. We, we run it sequentially. What we run in parallel is, is the update of the agents. So I, I don't expect, so far we are now testing this example of, of the TNF in, in the parallel implementation Gorov have done. We have fine <laughs> million of problems, but uh, but like the results are, are converging to the same that we got in, in the single node, and we're still fixing the issues, but uh, we don't expect to, to find any difference on that, basically because it, it's it's transparent for models. It doesn't know it's running a different computer. You just run a few steps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We have another question. Um, oh. Sorry, I think uh, yeah we have a uh, we have Arnau who has raised his uh, hand. Uh, one second, Arnau, can you talk now? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please go. Yes. Ahead. Okay, uh, it was about the the, the pre uh, previous question. So, yeah. the uh, Mavos doesn't do synchronous update, but only asynchronous update, and then you have one process, one trajectory per process. So it should, I mean, parallelization does not reach the, the trajectories uh, calculation of, of my boss. So it should not, it should not interfere with the, with the trajectories. And then I think the reachability, the attractor reachability will be the same because the, the network is the same. So uh, unless you have mutants, then, then yes, the reachability changes, but that's it. That, that was my, my okay. sense. Thanks for now. Yeah, we have Co co compare uh, physicel simulations in, in, in parallel and in uh, like physicel is parallel, but it run it's not distributed. It cannot run in several computers. Uh, what Borov has performed is that we can split the simulation and run the parallelism in different computers. And so far, Borov uh, is able to run identical simulations uh, or as much identical as it can be done because simulation ha has a, a stochastic component. So they had some random number generator there, and so they cannot be identical. Even if you pick the seed uh, that you set into a non random number generator, uh, because when you have uh, multiple threads, even if you're not running in different computers, uh, it's it cannot be a bit bit wise, or I can't remember like exactly the same simulation. You, you cannot have exactly the same simulation. You the only way to have the exactly the same simulation is to have a simulation running with a single thread setting. Uh, the complex, uh, the random number series of C. That's the only way. But taking that into account, uh, like you can run the distributed simulation and the single node simulation, and you got virtually the same results. So we we'll have to carefully test that. And for the deterministic part, like uh, the partial differential equation, you got exactly the same, the same values for the parallel or distributed parallel one and, and, and non-distributed one. Okay. 
Okay, thank you both. Um, we have another question. Um, how would you make your use cases more complex? Does the tool allow to have extracellular matrix and blood vessels? Yes, 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 yes. You, you can. So Marco Fruscone and, and, and Vincent Noel and the people of Kiri are, are developing a, a model of, of tumor invasion. And basically, you can, there are several ways of, of modeling the extracellular matrix, and they are modeling in, in some way. So the cell can uh, bind or attach to the extracellular cell matrix and that can trigger different uh, internal states of the cell and they can degrade and like open tunnels in, into the extracellular cell matrix, but this is a, an ongoing work. And now it's also involved there. So if he wants to add something else, I will allow him. Uh, and what were the other, sorry, uh, how, how, how uh, use cases can be more complex. Like if, if you keep increasing the number of intracellular models, and the complexity of the model, the interaction, uh, you, you can also uh, bind that to omic data. So if you have spatial transcriptomic and you see different uh, pattern of expression in different parts of, of a tumor, for instance, uh, you, you can use that to inform the model and, and to create an initial condition when you, you have cells uh, with the uh, phenotypic uh, uh, variability. And if you have sequencing data, you, you can add like uh, genetic heterogeneity and have different cell type with different uh, genetic profiles that behave different. So in, you, you can increase complexity as far as, as you want, uh, but you have to take care that uh, there is a limit in which you will be able to calibrate or take care of the uncertainty of, of your model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, we have another question. How does um, how does the model exploration interact with SLURM in the HPC cluster? Is it possible to use pipeline or workflow software like Nextflow uh, with it? Uh, I'm not very familiar with Nextflow, so I, let me find here. So basically, uh, Swift or or Amuse itself, uh, it's a uh, solve the problem of, of so it's uh, architecture independent or, or Q system is independent. So when you configure the, the running file for, for a Muse, which is a bash file, you, you tell the Muse or, or Swift that it's going to run in, in Slurm and you tell them uh, what are the number of resources, the computing time, and all the details we usually set up in an S batch file. And it solves the problem of talking to, to a Slurm. So after Slurm get the job uh, ready to run, uh, like Swift will take care of, of the nodes. And basically it compiles to MPI if you want to go into the details. And inside Swift, you, you can get the ranks of the different process you, you have been assigned and we use them to, to span the different simulations. Uh, but like the, we, we run or we write the, the workflow in, in Swift itself. So here in our workflow, we run the simulations. We got a piece of Python code for reading the output of the simulation parsing them, calculate or aggregate the, the, the different trajectories, compare them to experimental data or whatever reference or just to minimize the number of cells uh, and uh, make that uh, understandable for the model exploration algorithm. So it, I, I believe it can be combined with, with other pipelines or, or can, like you, you can rewrite the, we, we start using a Muse basically because there was already a, a, a repository using a Muse with VCCL, uh, and it, it was easy to start modifying that, that starting from scratch. But uh, I think the same thing that a Muse can done can be done with uh, in-house tools like, like comms and, and by comms. So th this kind of workflows that basically run simulations and parse the output and talk to some other algorithm about generating new parameters uh, can be done in anything. But uh, that's... I don't know if I answered the question. Mm -hmm. I think you did, but I mean, otherwise there's still time if the person wants to, <laughs> to follow up. Um, we have another question, which is, uh, what skills are required for an experimentalist to enter the field of systems biology? That's a more, a more yeah, general question. Uh, I think first thing is want to go into that direction. Uh, skills. Uh, Okay, uh, 
some basic skills some programming are always useful uh some uh i i'm talking the technical skills uh then you, you got like the, the the more uh conceptual skill like some some math or some idea of how more works but uh you you don't need to know too much details on the mathematics if you want to run simulations uh but more the conceptual model you want to to develop uh the idea of physicel when when paul macklin started developing it is to make it a tool accessible for a non-expert user so in the current state i think you need to get some familiarity with programming language and the kind of configuration file and how to pick parameter and to have an understanding of, of the decision processes what what is diffusion what is a diffusion constant i think an experimentalist knows know that so i think it it's a uh, have a learning curve but it is it, doable and it's uh that's the idea that the people from from the experimental side can uh, have its own model that mimics the, the experimental the, the experiment that they are running so i think it's it's very and, and we want that so we will try to to make it even easier so with providing some user interface to defining the parameters and the cell type so currently it will require some skills but uh, probably in, in one year it will be much 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 easier okay great great, great answer um, we have one more question, but maybe uh, just uh, before that one, you could, you can, uh, if you can go to the slide of the upcoming webinars. So just uh, yeah, sure. when we answer that one, people can see the ones that are already open and announced. Okay, so we have uh, one in in after Christmas in January and another one at the beginning of, of March and registration is already open on the website. So uh, we have another question, which is related to the one before from the, um, about the attractor reachability. So it's um, following the question of the attractor reachability. I am curious about the effect of parallel parallelization on the speed of reachability. Uh, uh, again, I'm not the expert. A, I mean, we have also Arnau if he wants to, I mean, just because I saw that he also raised his hand. So if if uh, you want to, uh, oh, no. <laughs> yes, hello, hello, hi. So um, to be honest, we we have not we have not uh, compared the reachability of of my boss in parallel and and without uh, parallel. I mean, again, here we're only using one trajectory per agent. So I mean, it's lightning it's lightning fast. So it's not something that was that was worrisome to us. Uh, but as far as I know, Vincent Noel from, from Curie is working on an MPI version of my boss. Uh, and, and this is one of the questions that he's asking himself. So maybe in future, in future webinars, we can, we can have him uh, explaining how, how he did that for the MPI version of uh, my boss. But yeah, I mean, the short answer is that we didn't check the, the, the reachability uh, comparison. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And we... Uh, take notice of the of the future webinar idea. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, yeah, there's the the person who has the question. Uh, thanks you for the answers, and maybe the very last question, uh, just related to the uh, moving to the, to the systems biology. Someone said, uh, which programming language uh, could they focus uh, to as a beginner in programming? Um, so as a beginner, with prog which programming language should I focus on that will help me with the current context? I, I would say I would say Python without much doubt. I I been teaching Python for, for longer years, and I think it's a very easy language and it's very powerful. So it's like a, a Swiss knife. It uh, have capability for doing many things. Like you can do machine learning, you can do plots, you can do simulations, you can do, and it's a very friendly language for for learning. And uh, there are uh, there, there is uh, uh, an ongoing project uh, led by Randy Hayland and in collaboration with people in, in the VSC to, to develop an, an interface, a Python interface for developing models, physical models from Python. So it will be an interface, so it will be transparent. And I think uh, Mavos also has a, a Python interface. Uh, in the case of Cobrexa, it's, uh, it's written in Julia, which is not, it's different 
from Python, but once you learn Python, you 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 can uh, more easily jump into into Julia because uh, they are somehow related. And uh, and if, if you don't want to go into Julia, there is a, the the more uh, smaller version of, of Cobra, which is Cobra Pi, which is also a tool for running uh, metabolic models in, in in Python language. So I think Python it's a very complete language. I for sure will go into Python. That's my favorite one. Uh, it's bias here. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for that one. And yeah, uh, we have no more questions, but thank you very much, Miguel, for the uh, great presentation and a very good uh, Q&A section. And uh, just everyone, as you can see on the screen, uh, you can register already for the upcoming webinars. Um, so thank you, everyone, and have a nice day. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for, for the question. Very great question. Thank you, Daniel, for the introduction. Thank you, Arnau, for the support. And, and that's it. Have a nice afternoon and see you in the next uh, webinars. Thank you very much. See you. Bye bye.